Breton law was originally an oral tradition dating back since time immemorial, and it was not written down until around the 7th century. This native system of law was indigenous to the people living on that land, and it was indicative of their customs and their nature. And it was starkly different from imposed colonial systems of law. Indigenous systems mature gradually and naturally in line with the people living on that land and using it. But a famous Roman jurist and scholar and statesman named Cicero once said that history is the witness that testifies to the passing of time. It illumines reality, vitalizes memory, provides guidance in daily life and brings us tidings of antiquity. Now, I'm not going to go back into its ancient, ancient past. I'm going to focus on the influence of Anglo-Norman invasions in Irish history. But before I go back that far, I just want to talk about a proclamation that was issued by King James I of England in 1603. And this proclamation marked the official end of the Breton law, even though remnants remained sort of embedded in the cultural identity and the nature of the people. The Attorney General for Ireland at that time, under uh, King James I, was called Sir John Davies. And he was a man who was instrumental in the final abolishment of the Breton laws. But he once said of Ireland, that there is no nation of people under the sun that loves equal and indifferent justice better than the Irish, or will rest better satisfied with the execution thereof, even though it be against themselves, so that they too may have the protection and the benefit of the law when upon just cause they desire it. So this was a guy who seemed to hold the Irish in high regard, or at least their approach to justice in high regard. But even still, Davies was a man who believed in the supremacy of the monarch. And he believed that King James was the rightful king of Ireland. And that a king cannot be considered sovereign where others give laws without reference to him. So the existence of native Irish law undermined the authority of the laws issued by decree of the sovereign of the crown. So to fully appreciate the severity of this prolonged attack on native Irish society and their system of law, we must trace its demise a little further back through history. Now I've said before that, and it's, it's, I think it's a true statement to make, that the laws of a land are an irrebuttable witness to the character of the people who inhabit it. In order for the English conquest of Ireland to be successful, it was essential that the native Irish laws be eradicated and replaced with the authority and dominance of the King's Law. The first significant advance occurred in 1155 when the Catholic Pope Adrian IV, the Vatican's first and only ever English Pope, issued the Papal Bull Law Debilitor, which sanctioned the invasion of Ireland by King Henry II. This Papal Bull bestowed the title of Dominus Hiberniae, the Lord of Ireland, and made Ireland a feudal possession of King Henry II. In return for this, he was to collect a penny per hearth of the tax roll to be paid to the Vatican, and he was to establish the supremacy of the papacy and canon law over the land. Specifically, he was to bring about the Gregorian reforms, the reforms of Pope Gregory, which included the celibacy of priests and the centrality and supremacy of the Church of Rome.
Someone once said of King Henry that there is indeed no doubt, as thy highness doth as also acknowledge, that Ireland and all other islands which Christ, the Son of Righteousness, has illumined, and which have received the doctrines of the Christian faith, belong to the jurisdiction of St. Peter and the Roman Holy Church. And that was actually a quote from the papal bull itself. It wasn't from Henry II. It's text from the papal bull, which basically declares the supremacy of the Roman Church over anywhere where the sun rises in the world. And by proxy, all the islands of Europe. The Anglo-Norman invasion of Ireland began shortly after this decree was given, shortly after this permission was given by the Pope. And the invasion began in 1169. And it had been, at this stage, there was a new Pope in power, and it was further authorised by this Pope, who was Pope Alexander III. And when Pope Alexander III gave authorisation, he, he did so with the intention or to give the king the power to, quote, end the filthy practices of the barbarous nation. And, of course, once again, to secure the Irish people with a levy to Rome, to get a tax paid from Ireland to Rome. But a further catalyst was required for this invasion of Ireland. And this occurred when the king of Leinster, at the time, the Irish King of Leinster. And I must point out that the Irish system of kings was completely different than the English system of kings, even the idea of what a king was. It would be better to think of an Irish king as a leader and an English king as a ruler. But the King of Leinster at the time, Dermot McMorrow, sought the English king help in regaining control of his kingdom. In 1166, upon the death of Mukta MacLachlan, who was the Irish Ard Rhee, or High King, and Chief of Tyrone at the time. Uh, well, when he died, Dermot MacMurr lost the protection of the High King. And when the new High King came into power, who was called Rory O'Connor, Dermot MacMurr was dispossessed of his lands. Um, basically, he was sort of sent into exile, and the reason he'd done this is because earlier he had abducted the wife of of another king turning our work so there's all sorts of mad uh, political intrigue going on back then robbing each other's wives and all this sort of stuff and so in a bid to reclaim his throne mcmurra went and sought the help of king henry ii and this happened in, in the year of 1166 and henry agreed to this request because he could see that he would strengthen his power over ireland at the same time and um, but it wasn't until McMurra met a Welsh baron who was called Strigul, or he's better known by his nickname Strongbow. And Strongbow was the second Earl of Pembroke, Richard de Clare. By offering his daughter Aoife's hand in marriage, in return for his regaining the kinship of Leinster, McMurra managed to secure the support he was desperately needing, and Strongbow agreed to help him in his cause, reclaiming his control over the, the Kingdom of Leinster. So the first Norman knights landed on Irish soil in 1167, and on the 23rd of August, a few years later in 1170, Strongbow landed at Waterford with 1,000 troops and 200 knights, and quickly captured control of the territory. They then quickly moved through the neighbouring Viking settlements of Wexford and Dublin and conquered them also. And shortly after this, you know, true to his word, uh, McMurrow gave his daughter Aoife's hand in marriage to Strongbow and they're married in Christchurch Cathedral. And even if you go to Christchurch Cathedral in Dublin today, there is an effigy there to, uh, to Strongbow to this day. So once McMorrow's power was restored, you know, um, he was back King of Leinster. Um, fortunately, you know, what he'd done is he'd basically invited these Anglo-Norman troops and the help of King Henry into Ireland. 
So he had given them this, like, you know, uh, way in to begin the invasion just to get his, his, his power restored over the kingship of Leinster. But in 1171, the same year that his power was restored, he died. In pretty early on, it was actually in May of that year, so he didn't have the throne for too long. So upon his death, his son Donald McMurray claimed the kingship of Leinster according to his rights under the Breton law. But at the same time, Strongbow claimed the kingship through the right of his wife, Aoife, as was promised to him by Dermot McMurray. So just to explain that a little bit more, inheritance under the Breton law was very different than inheritance under English law. And Donald McMurray, as, as the son of, of, um, of Dermot McMurray, the king of Leinster, he claimed the kingship. But as part of the agreement, which would have been valid under English law, uh, Dermot had promised the kingship to Strongbow. It's just, and the reason why I bring that up is because it's an interesting example of one of the first times where we see this conflict of legal systems. Usually when we think of the conflict between Ireland and England, we automatically think of it as being a religious one. And we seldom have ever stopped to think of it as being a legal one. So, you know, that's just, this is just an example of where you can see friction between the two legal systems. So, once they conquered the areas of Waterford, Wexford and Dublin, um, these became known as the Pale, or in Irish, on fail. And the word Pale is derived from the Latin word Palus, P-A-L-U-S, meaning a stake which supports a fence. So the word pale is where we get the idea of a boundary. So the pale of Wexford, Waterford and Dublin was pretty much the boundary um, between English and Irish rule on the island. And while Strongbow was in Ireland, he had significantly increased his power and prestige through his invasion. And... Fearing the rise of a rival Norman state in Ireland, King Henry started to get a little bit restless. So what Strongbow did is he decided to surrender the strongholds of the Pale over to King Henry. In return, he could keep his land and titles. This is the way they work. It's all bribery and, and uh, you know, threats, uh, veiled threats and things like this. Politics, if you will. But before the end of the year... King Henry became the first English king to stand on Eng Irish soil and breed Irish air. He held a Curia Regis, or King's Council, at Waterford, where he proclaimed the laws of England to be freely and received and confirmed in Ireland. This proclamation was nothing more than a statement of intent, because in reality the English law was only applying in the pale, um, the rest of Ireland, everywhere outside Waterford, Wexford and Dublin, continue to you know, keep true to the native Irish traditions, continue to speak their language and their customs, keep their customs. So King Henry was succeeded by his son, King John of England, who received the title of Dominus Hibernia, Lord of Ireland, from his father. Because title is like property. And... You can pass title from one person to another. You can transfer property. And these sort of titles transfer upon death. So upon the death of King Henry, the title that was given to him by the church, by the Vatican, Lord of Ireland, uh, was then passed over to his son, King John of England. And during his reign, King John increased control over the east coast of Ireland and pushed upwards towards Ulster. Using the political situation in Ireland to his advantage, King John secured the fealty, the allegiance, of many Irish lords who had been dispossessed and hoped to be restored to their lands, while simultaneously weakening the position of the Norman lords. So, just to recap this briefly, the initial invasion was an Anglo-Norman invasion. The Norman factions, if you will, began to get increasingly strong which worried the Anglo factions who were still seated uh, over in England, the monarchs. So during the reign of King John, he, he went 
over to Ireland and who, as as Lord of Ireland, he began to make agreements with the the Irish lords, the Irish landowners who had been dispossessed from their lands, um, and who hoped to reclaim their territory back from the Norman lords. So again, politics, intrigue, bribery, and it's all for the greed of the monarchs and the lords. When you get down to the nuts and bolts of it. So in 1204, King John established a system of royal writs, which first made the laws of England applicable to the colonists and then later on established the right to trial by jury in criminal cases. And before he established this, quarrels between lords and knights were being settled by trial and wager of battle. King John gave his legal representative, the Justiciar, the power to write legal writs which have authority throughout the controlled regions of Ireland. And later in 1204, he prohibited his subjects, the king prohibited his subjects, from answering in any court case to anyone but the king himself or his appointed justices. <laughs> 